go hard or go home? How hard do you need to train? What's up guys, new study out looking at 10 weeks of resistance training, either training one rep shy of failure or in a range of one to four reps shy of failure. I am bringing this up because I have interviewed several of the top researchers in muscular hypertrophy for my podcast now, Brad Schoenfeld and Stuart Phillips. And one of the consistent things they say is the most important thing for muscle hypertrophy is to have sufficient intensity with your training, meaning getting close enough to failure. And there are some studies out there, including a meta-regression from my coach for powerlifting, Zach Robinson, showing that hypertrophy improves the closer you get to failure. But again, meta-regressions are not necessarily direct examinations. They are trying to look at data that already exists and extrapolate out. We have a couple of studies now looking at either training to failure or one or two reps shy of failure and showing no difference in hypertrophy. And some of them actually show maybe a little bit better strength adaptations in people who stop shy of failure. A new study came out, uh, Brad Schoenfeld's on the paper, as well as some other really great authors in hypertrophy. And they were looking at 10 weeks of resistance training in people who were very well trained. So they had to have at least two years of continuous resistance training at least two times a week and up to nine years. So the inclusion criteria, for example, for men was they had to squat at least 1.35 times their body weight. And so for me, somebody like me, that'd be like 270 something pounds, which probably doesn't sound like much, but I promise you, if you go in your local gym, you can't find very many people who can squat over 250 pounds to depth. And the researchers actually had an apparatus when they were testing them to make sure that their hip joint was going below the knee joint because it would give an audible beep whenever the hip joint went below the knee joint. So it's pretty hard to find people who can squat to death with that kind of weight. And so they also went up to like, basically somebody my size could go up to squatting like 450 pounds. I think 2.3 times their body weight was the cap. So they wanted well-trained people, but not like elite people essentially. And so they had them train for 10 weeks with two different types of training. First type of training was they had them train one rep shy of failure and they tested their accuracy with RIR. So RIR means repetitions in reserve. How far from failure are you? An RIR of one means you're one rep shy of failure. RIR of four means you're four rep shy of failure. So one group was training to RIR of one. The other group was training to RIR of anywhere from one to four. Now the way it worked was they had two five-week training blocks, so 10 weeks of training total. The RIR of one group just trained an RIR of one. And in the other group, they started out at an RIR of four and gradually increased the intensity as the study went on so that by the final week, they were doing an RIR of one in both five-week training blocks. They also periodized these programs. So during the first five weeks of training, these people were training, for example, on their squat and bench press between seven and nine reps. And then during the second five weeks, they were training between four and six reps. And at the end of the study, they looked at like cross-sectional area of the vastus lateralis of the quads and the triceps. And they also looked at one rep maximum for squat, one rep maximum for bench. And also they had people do their 10 rep maximums before they started the study. And then at the end of the study, had them do it again. And they also had them find a new 10 rep max at the end of the study. So not just looking at one rep max strength, but also looking at, I guess you would call it like strength endurance or rep performance. So what did they find? Well, at the end of the study, they found that both groups increased their cross-sectional area of the quadriceps and there was no difference between groups. In the triceps, they found that there was no difference between the groups, but only the group that was doing the RIR of one to four increased their triceps cross-sectional area over time. Now this might sound weird, and this is how statistics can get weird sometimes. So both groups increased, but the variance made it such that we could not show statistical difference between the two groups who were training. So we're talking about two different statistical analysis happen here. There's a statistical analysis looking at the two groups compared to each other, and then there's statistical analysis looking at the groups at the end compared to time. Compared to each other, they could not show a statistical difference probably because of the variance between the groups. But compared to the beginning of the study, the group doing RIR 1 to 4 did increase their cross-sectional area of their triceps. So I don't really know what to make of that. Do I think it's a real difference? It's hard to tell with the variance there, but it certainly shows that training 
RIR1 to 4 doesn't seem to negatively inhibit gains compared to RIR1. There was also no difference in one rep max on the squat or bench press between either groups. Uh, both increased squat and bench press over time. There was also no difference in volume load between the groups. And volume load is number of reps times the number of sets times the weight. Now this might be confusing based on the literature showing you get closer to failure, you get better hypertrophy, like, and this study suggests maybe you actually get a little bit better hypertrophy staying further away from failure. What could explain this? It's important to point out a lot of the studies that were looking at proximity to failure and hypertrophy we're doing them with a lot of isolation exercises because it's easier to assess. It does appear that to get maximum muscle activation, you do have to train closer to failure with isolation exercises. But with compound exercises, it appears you get a greater amount of muscle activation further away from failure than you do with isolation exercises. And this study did use quite a few compound movements in it. So I don't know if that's the reason that they found this, but it could be a possible explanation. And just think about it from an exertion point of view, from a difficulty point of view. I can tell you a squat with an RIR of five is harder for me than a leg extension at an RIR of one. Like it feels more difficult, even though I can grind out some more reps, it feels more difficult to me. It's also important to note that these folks got better at estimating their RIR over time uh, to where by the end, they were less than half a rep variance on average off their squat. They tended to underestimate by a half rep, meaning if they thought they were one rep shy of failure, they might've been like 1.5 or two. People say, how can you get half a rep variance? Well, that's just what happens when you have averages. And on bench press, there was actually basically no difference between their perceived RIR and their actual RIR. They pretty much could estimate it dead on. Now here's where these results get interesting. And I like what this paper did because most studies just report averages, but I like when researchers go a little bit deeper. And so they looked at, okay, there's an average, but how many of the participants increased their squat one rep max by more than five kilograms? And in the RIR of one group, only five out of 15 increased their squat more than five kilograms. And two participants had no increase in their squat. But in the RIR of one to four group, 13 participants increased their squat by more than five kilograms. That tends to suggest that even though the average wasn't different, there might be more consistent results with training a little bit further from failure when it comes to strength. Now, why could that be? Training close to failure does elicit more central fatigue, more neuromuscular fatigue than training a little bit further away from failure. And so perhaps over time, people training at a lower fatigue level had better improvements, better recovery, and were able to perform better in the one rep max. Now what's my takeaway from this? My takeaway is this is very much in alignment with the research literature we already have out there, which suggests the following. You need to get close to failure, but we're not sure exactly how close. Do you need to train to failure for optimal hypertrophy? It doesn't appear so. Do you need to train within two reps, three reps, four reps? We don't know. And again, this wasn't like they let them select between one and four RIR the entire duration of the study. They did get up to one RIR by the end of the study. So perhaps what this study suggests is that in order to mitigate the neuromuscular fatigue associated with training close to failure, you're better off using a graded approach to doing so, so that you can manage fatigue better, give your body a chance to adapt before you really go hard close to failure. And it also is in alignment with the research suggesting that perhaps for compound movements, you can train a little bit further away from failure and still get the same results, but with isolation movements, you probably need to train a little bit closer to failure. We don't know the answers. We don't know what the perfect RIR is right now. It may be different for different exercises, depending on how much muscular and neuromuscular fatigue is induced by these exercises. But the take home is train close to failure, but don't need to train to failure or probably even within one rep of failure to get maximal hypertrophy and it may actually be a little bit better for strength to stay a little bit further away from failure. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. If you're worried about how to like do all this stuff, you go to the BioLane Workout Builder, and we have RIR, RPE-based programs right there. We take all the guesswork out of it. You can get access to all my science-based programming, and it's only $12.99 a month. Link is in the description. Check it out.